We have single cylinder engines, twins, triples, four pots, inline fives, straight sixes, but then we start to skip some numbers up to V8s, V10s, V12s, even all the way up to V and W16s. You've probably never thought about this before, but now that you've clicked this video, let's talk about it. Why is there no such thing as a seven cylinder engine? Well, engines with seven cylinders do technically exist, just not in cars. You can get inline sevens in big industrial applications and in radial aircraft engines. We'll get to those later. But there has never been a seven cylinder engine in a car. The main reason is engine balancing. There is a lot going on in an internal combustion engine. You've got pistons being fired up and down cylinders. That power is then translated through the cod rod down to a rotating crankshaft. All of that is due to a mixture of fuel and air, and then you've got oil and water coursing all the way through it to keep it cool and stop it seizing. With all of that movement within an engine, it's going to create a lot of unwanted vibration. Considering an engine rotates at thousands of times per minute, you want to counteract that vibration as much as possible, otherwise your engine is literally going to shake itself to pieces. That process is called engine balancing. We have a new sponsor on the channel that I think you guys from the US are really going to like. Let me explain what the people at Bespoke Post are all about. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering a box of awesome with top shelf goods from under the radar brands. It's free to join and you can skip a month or cancel any time. 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based in the US. Every month, they introduce members to cool new products, outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, clothing, all based on a preference quiz that you fill out. Every box of awesome has around $70 worth of goods inside, but costs you only a fraction of the value. You'll get a box of awesome assigned to you, and before it's shipped, you'll get a preview of what comes inside to decide if you'd like to one, keep it, two, swap it from a different box, or three, skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. The stuff in these boxes is genuinely really cool. The Weekender box has this stylish carry-all bag that comes in four different colors. I'd go for khaki myself. And the Frontier box is my personal favorite, as you get a really slick Opinel knife, a fountain pen with ink, a notebook, and a bottle opener. I want all of that in my life. To get 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in the description and enter Drive Tribe 20 at checkout or go to bespokepost.com forward slash Drive Tribe 20. Now, some engines need less balancing or none at all compared to others, depending on their cylinder count and layout. A straight six is famously balanced, and although there's more maths to it, you can effectively see why it's balanced with the two outside cylinders moving together, then the two in from that, then the inner two. Straight away, you can see why a straight six is smooth and balanced. If we pick a less uniform engine layout, let's say a three cylinder engine like in Yuki, things aren't as simple. You've got an odd number of pistons firing at specific times that naturally leads to an imbalance. Triples generally need a balancing shaft that runs alongside the crankshaft to completely counteract that lack of balance. And I remember a whole module at university where you learn to calculate the amount of primary and secondary force that needs cancelled out. Aside from a full balancing shaft, you can also counterweight the crankshaft itself to even things out. In fact, if we let you hear Yuki now, you can hear the imbalance going on. firing order and the vibrations that come from the engine layout leads to the classic thrum of a three-cylinder engine. Some turbo chuff doesn't hurt either. That sound comes from the fact that there are gaps between each cylinder firing. Let's do some quick maths. By using this equation, you can find out the firing interval of an engine. So we have four strokes, a stroke takes 180 degrees, and our cylinder count is three in this situation. 
Plug those numbers in and we find out that a three cylinder fires for every 240 degrees of crankshaft rotation. To calculate the overlap in those cylinders firing, you take that 180 degrees and subtract the firing interval. That produces minus 60 degrees in a three cylinder. That means there is no overlap there is actually 60 degrees of silence within a three cylinders four stroke cycle where there's nothing firing. That creates the natural unevenness of a three cylinder engine because you can imagine that crankshaft being jolted by the first cylinder firing, but then it spins for a relatively long amount of time not under power before the next cylinder fires and on and on. So you can imagine that crankshaft jolting round compared to other engines. Now you may think that a higher odd number of cylinders might make things worse, say an inline five, but it's actually the opposite. A five cylinder engine is much smoother than a three cylinder engine. You can see that through the maths for a five cylinder engine. If you plug in those numbers, we see that the firing interval is 144 degrees and it has an overlap of 36 degrees. By having more cylinders, the crankshaft encounters more explosions that essentially merge together and overlap, making for a smoother engine. The more cylinders you have firing over that 720 degree four stroke cycle, the smoother running the engine is thanks to less of an imbalance, with each cylinder helping to cancel out forces from other cylinders. That's why a single cylinder engine is the shakiest thing you can have and needs a massive counterweight. A three cylinder still vibrates a lot, but to far less an extent. A five cylinder is getting pretty smooth. A six is even better thanks to that extra cylinder, as well as being symmetrical and on and on. I've sat and tried to resurrect my university degree to figure out the maths for the subject of today's video, an inline seven. I started with the crank spacing. You divide 360 by seven and you get 51.4 degrees. That's by far the weirdest number I've seen associated with crank spacing. That means if you were to look down the end of a crankshaft, the crank journals that the con rods attached to would be at intervals of 51 4 degrees. The firing interval then comes out at 102.86 degrees, again an incredibly weird number, and the overlap is roughly 77 degrees, so more than a five cylinder. The firing order would come out at 1357246, and although it would share the natural imbalance of a three and a five cylinder, it would want to rock from end to end, those unwanted vibrations would be lessened thanks to having more cylinders. What's really cool and random is that someone on the internet has simulated what an inline seven engine would sound like. This one even has a turbo thrown in. Get a load of this. An inline seven then wouldn't be a complete disaster. It wouldn't be shaking itself to pieces but engineers over the years would look at this engine layout and think, why? A seven cylinder would be one cylinder more than the mighty, beautifully balanced straight six. The art of adding more cylinders to create more power comes from a time before forced induction was really invented. If you wanted to increase the power of an engine, you had to add displacement. But with the invention of the supercharger and turbocharger, the days started to dwindle of big high cylinder count engines because if you then wanted to increase power, you simply turned up the boost. When designing an engine, it's best practice really to stick to even numbers because if something's happening on one end of the engine, there's probably gonna be something happening on the other end of the engine to help balance things out. Like this straight six, while these two pistons are up, these two pistons are down. So when there's something happening on one end of the engine, there's something happening in the middle that's canceling things out. With V engines, with your two banks in general, if there's something happening on one bank, there's gonna be something happening on the other bank that's gonna help cancel things out. The second you add a cylinder, for example, to this straight six and make it a straight seven, 
you're kind of mucking up that balance. You would have to re-engineer the entire thing to cope with that seventh cylinder. So really, it's just needless overcomplication. In general, keep it even. Another problem that engineers would face would be the length of the crankshaft. Most crankshafts don't go any longer than six cylinders because when engines have more cylinders than six, generally they turn into Vs, so V8s, V10s, and V12s. That's because the longer you make your crankshaft, the more susceptible it is to torsional vibrations. It's gonna to want to bend and twist. To stop that happening, you have to make it stiffer, and in doing so, you're probably gonna make it heavier. That means it's not gonna to want to rotate as easily. So by adding a cylinder to this straight six crankshaft, not only are you gonna to need to redo all the balancing, you're also gonna to have to bulk up the crankshaft. This is the crank from this Jag straight six, and trust me, it's bulky enough. Oh. But let's not forget the mighty straight eight engine. One of those things powered the early Alfa Romeo F1 cars to numerous wins and was the solution to create more power than a straight six and also being generally more reliable by distributing the power over more cylinders. That crankshaft would be even longer, but it's not that simple. An inline eight has the benefit of being essentially two inline four cylinders connected together, so it's naturally balanced by them working in tandem. An inline seven would have almost just as long a crankshaft, but with more imbalance, therefore adding unnecessary engineering complexity. Packaging is another thing. A straight six is long enough, but for the same reason that the straight eight died out, if you were to add a cylinder to this and make it an inline seven, you would need more room in the engine bay. Your weight distribution would probably be all off. And you can also find other engine layouts that make more power in a much smoother fashion. Essentially, there are zero reasons for a seven cylinder engine to exist in a road car. If you want the best, easiest, smoothest inline engine for your car, pick a straight six, especially one with a massive supercharger attached. That's quite nice. As I said earlier in the video, seven cylinder engines do exist, just not in cars. There have been a few over the years and the most recent one I could find is a Sisu diesel engine created by a company called ACGO for their combine harvesters. That manufacturer creates modular engines with each cylinder being 1.4 liters and they each have their own cylinder head. That means they can just multiply up to create power because their engines are naturally aspirated. The engineers behind this 9.8 liter inline seven described the process of creating the crankshaft as simply putting their four cylinder crank onto their three cylinder crank. And the seven cylinder creates 80 horsepower more than the straight six. So there you go. That's the proof of the concept. A seven cylinder engine can work. Straight sevens can also be found in submarines and ships, and what helps these industrial engines is that they're mostly operating at a single RPM. That means the engineers can develop the engine based on that one engine speed and not have to worry about much else. That wouldn't be possible in a car that is doing far more acceleration and needs to be more versatile than something like a combine harvester. Then we have radial engines that you can find in aircraft, which often use odd number layouts like five, seven, nine, and even 11 cylinders, seeing as they're all working away and then towards each other on the same axial plane. So you can have one big counterweight rotating around, keeping it balanced. So there you go, seven cylinder engines. They have their uses, just not in cars. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. I've been Mike and don't forget to subscribe to Drive Tribe.